Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today in the Mercury Library with old friend Don Hancock, who is the director of the Nuclear Waste Safety Program at the Southwest Research and Information Center in Albuquerque. We're here to talk today about, about something really that uh, isn't supposed to have happened, or indeed ever happened, uh, a radioactive leak from uh, the Waste Isolation Pilot Project, WIP, outside of Carlsbad. This is really a, a frightening and, uh, and really horrendous development. And uh, I'm very, very happy to have Don here, who is the recognized and acknowledged by almost everyone, uh, citizen expert on nuclear matters in New Mexico. So Don, it's wonderful to have you here, even though this is a terrible, <laughs> a terrible problem that we're now facing. Thanks. It's good to be here. Thanks for asking me. So. We have uh, an event that's been acknowledged to happen, but we have great mysteries around it. We have reports that say people have been exposed to radioactivity, and then we have uh, these reports rescinded, basically. We have um, uh, almost um, no solid knowledge about exactly what happened. There's a lot of speculation about what happened underground, uh, but we really don't know what it is. Uh, your website talks of, has a wonderful long list of all the things we don't know about this leak, and I'd love you to talk about those at some point. But what, in your judgment, what has happened? And as best as you can tell, why? So what we think we know bear outlines, but as you've said, there's Mo, more, much more that we don't know than what we do know. But um, the Department of Energy's underground continuous air monitoring in the underground at WIP went off at 11.30 in the evening, Friday evening, February 14th, Valentine's Day, that th there was a radiation leak. Fortunately, there were no workers underground at the time and hadn't been for several hours before. But there were 13 workers above ground on the surface. And DOE said they checked them out, checked to see if there was any radiation on the surface, you know, and thought no problem because when that underground air monitor gets triggered, it automatically changes the exhaust, the underground exhaust to go through a filtering process. So in theory, the filters are going to filter out the radiation mm -hmm. as opposed to just dumping everything out into the air, which would normally be the case if the ventilation system was just working without going through the filtration. So they thought the system was working fine. They said they did some radiological testing and they didn't find any contamination on the workers or at the facility or on the equipment or anything on the surface. So they thought, you know, whatever, what, they didn't know what happened, but whatever happened, it wasn't really very bad and nothing had come out. And so there was no harm, as they said at the time, there's no uh, harm to um, human health or the environment. Um, they then compounded that problem, in my view, in a, in a very horrible way by the next morning allowing the Saturday morning shift to come to work. So you had dozens, we don't know the exact number, but we had dozens of people coming to work on Saturday morning when there was, in fact, contamination, but nobody knew it or was acknowledging it. So you compound this problem um, so again, they did further checking and by five o'clock on Saturday afternoon, they decided everything was still okay. They could, hadn't found anything, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we had this situation where a, a serious accident happened, but the Department of Energy and their operating contractor, Nuclear Waste Partnership, seemed to, they definitely behaved as if nothing had come out the exhaust shaft or into the environment, and they said they, all their testing said, you know, no harm, no foul, no, no problem. So what that did was a couple of things. It set up a situation where, because what they were saying was demonstrably false after the fact, even they 
you know, eventually admitted, yes, there was radiation release, yes, the 13 workers were contaminated, et cetera. So that set up a very bad dynamic just in terms of trust and credibility and information. But it also meant that some of how this incident could have been better contained also didn't happen because you had workers, you know, going home, people who were contaminated internally but didn't know it, going home. It was 11 and a half days, February 26th, before the workers were told you, you test positively for internal radiation contamination. So it's not very credible to think that they inhaled plutonium and americium and but didn't get it any place else and didn't take it with them in their vehicles take it to their homes potentially etc we don't know any of that but again the testing of people's vehicles the testing of people's homes the testing of the workers families haven't been done those workers that came on saturday morning have now been given bioSA sampling to see whether there are indications from them of of internal contamination those results aren't back yet so you know three weeks after the incident some dozens of workers don't know whether they're contaminated or not um, in the meantime of course uh, Four and a half days later, on Wednesday, February 19th, the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring Center, which has ongoing air sampling in the area and so regularly is taking air sampling and essentially had never found any radioactivity in their monitors, more than just a little bit of what they perceive to be background and for radiation, not anything from the underground. Um, after the, they did sampling on Sunday morning, and at, at a site six-tenths of a mile away from the exhaust shaft, so six-tenths of a mile away from where presumably the radiation came out of the exhaust shaft, and they found uh, levels of americium-241 and plutonium-239 and 240 that had to be from the underground waste. So we had, at that point, we had confirmation that there was a leak. The Department of Energy you know, then basically they never issued a statement saying, oh, well, we were totally wrong, but they admitted that, yes, there was radioactive release. It did have to be from the underground. Um, and so, you know, again, we had this situation where the people who were supposed to be in charge were wrong. And, and so this, the situation has continued. So you go February 19th, we know that there is contamination in the general environment. Then a week later on February 26th comes the information that the 13 workers on the site have internal contamination. And oh, by the way, we've now decided we need to test the workers that came on Saturday morning, at least some of them and it'll be a week or two before we get the results of that back. Um, and interestingly, then, sort of the next stage of this continuing changing story from the Department of Energy and the contractor is when they released what you called the sort of retraction, which was based on the second round of urine samples from the 13 workers, where they said, oh, the test results now come back negative. Right. And so they didn't say that that meant that they didn't have contamination, but they said what it meant is it was so small that it wouldn't do any, wouldn't cause any health problems. Well, a couple of problems with that. One is your urine sample only picks up soluble plutonium. Uh. Some of the plutonium and americium in the whip waste is insoluble. And so the fact that it's not in your urine doesn't mean it's not still in your body. Right. That's why you have to do fecal analysis to see, you know, what's there. Um, and also some of it could still be in people's lungs where it's extremely dangerous from being inhaled. But the other part of that is the people who are saying there's no risk are not medical doctors, don't have training in treating people with internal radiation contamination. And although I've asked the question, you know, who are the medical experts who are actually treating and 
prescribing for the workers. There's been no answer to that. And, uh, and so at this point, we don't know whether the people who are, it would be better if DOE is making statements. They wouldn't say, we, the Department of Energy, they would say, Dr. So-and-so, you know, is saying this or make medical people available not to talk about individual cases, but to talk about a general case, which doctors can do and do do kind of thing. But no, they haven't done that. So, you know, the, the, but the other thing just to say about that release in terms of this continuing dribbling out of what is or isn't actually happening, buried on page two of that release, no risk to workers, results of the, um, the, the urine analysis, was for the first time a sentence that said, based on our monitoring, there is no significant off-site contamination. Now remember, they've been saying since February 14th and 15th, their tests have showed there's no off-site contamination, and originally there was no even on-site contamination. Well, now they're saying there's no significant off-site contamination, which can only mean there is some they think it's insignificant, but there is some now recorded off-site contamination. So the, the contamination has spread not just six tenths of a mile, but well beyond that. But again, what they should have said is, well, our testing has now shown that we have contamination at X levels of americium and plutonium or whatever they found at which locations. Rather than saying whether it's significant or insignificant, they should report the actual data so that then people could say, oh, well, okay. And they could have said, you know, we've tested these same sites two or three times and they never showed contamination and now they do show contamination, if that were the case, which would then say either the contamination that was already out is spreading or and or additional contamination is still coming out of the underground three weeks or so after the original, this original Valentine's Day release. Lots of people have been remembering that there was a fire down there in a truck apparently full of salt or something. I, I've always had a hard time understanding that. But this apparently has nothing to do with that. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about that relationship or non-relationship, and then tell us what might have happened down there, uh, in your judgment. On February 5th, nine days before the Valentine's Day release, a <clears throat> diesel-fueled vehicle, it's being called a truck, but it's not so much of a truck as we would think about it, it's a diesel-fueled vehicle that hauls salt in the underground, caught on fire, and the fire couldn't be put out right away for reasons we don't yet know because the accident investigation board that came out to look at that still hasn't issued a report. Mm -hmm. um, there were workers underground at that time. There were 86, a lot of underground workers. It took them 37 minutes, which is actually pretty fast, but it took them 37 minutes to evacuate the crew from the underground when the fire came out. So, but the fire was put out and it was confirmed later in the day when they sent the rescue folks down, the mine rescue people who are trained to deal with, you know, underground fires and situations when they sent those down, they made sure the fire was out, put foam on it, etc. So, so, and, and they said, they checked and other people, later other people walked around the underground and there was no indication that the fire in this, in this vehicle impacted the waste which was 2,000 feet away in a different part of the mine. Right. So it, 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 it doesn't seem like the fire directly caused the radiation leak. In fact, it would seem by any number of things, both the distance away, the fact the radiation alarms didn't go off on February 5th or until nine days later, you know, it can't. It doesn't really seem like it's possible the fire directly caused the leak. However, I do think there's a relation. One of the concerns, that, not a direct relation that the fire caused the release, but that they're both two parts of the symptoms of a more serious problem, which is what I call the declining safety culture at WIP. For a long time, the people running the WIP site, 
the Department of Energy and the Nuclear Waste Partners understood that their mission was safety first. In fact, their specific slogan, their specific campaign, as they called it, was start clean, stay clean. So there was never supposed to be any release at all, ever. That's what they promised. That's what they thought was going to be the case, etc. But I've been concerned for the last three years or so about what I see as a declining safety culture. And the two basic things that are related to this, and this is why there is some causation, is one, after 10 or 12 years of handling things, saying everything is fine, being acclaimed as a great safety record and everything is fine, um, it's not just with radiation, but other things, people can get a little complacent, oh, we know what we're doing, etc. So I was seeing some signs of complacency on the one hand, but on the other hand, they were definitely taking their eye off of the safety ball, the, the leadership were especially, because in the last three years, there have been no less than six specific proposals from the Department of Energy to expand the WIP mission, to bring other kinds of waste in that was that has always been illegal, like high-level waste, like commercial waste, mm -hmm. like power plant waste from, from the power plants, like even non-radioactive things like 10,000 metric tons of mercury to bring in store at WIP. So, and in addition, they were actually doing, so they were spending time, effort, and money on these environmental impact statements, these multi-million dollar proposals to expand WIP, but at the same time they were actually spending money in the underground at WIP doing mining using these vehicles hauling salt around, not to do mining to get ready to put waste in the ground, but to do mining to create little rooms in which they want to put in heaters to heat up the salt for the purpose of demonstrating that more than 30 years of scientific consensus that hot waste in salt is a non-starter. So they wanted to see if they can put heaters in the ground at WIP to show, oh, well, we know what's going on in the salt. It's okay. It's not really so bad as we thought. And so, again, that's, A, both taking the eye off of the safety ball and doing it, but it's creating more opportunities for these kind of truck accidents that happen. The more you're hauling salt around, particularly when you don't need to, the more likelihood you are of having the kind of accident. We don't know whether the actual vehicle that caught on fire was hauling salt from mining for waste or was hauling salt for mining for the heaters. Uh, but in one sense, it doesn't make any difference yeah. because they've, you know, they're more using the vehicles. The vehicles are more subject to, you know, problems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there is some connection between the two events in terms of this declining safety culture, taking your eye off the ball. It's not safety first anymore. It's we're, we're trying to promote WIP for other missions and other things and do things beyond just our safety mission because we can do more than one thing. Um, so that's the relationship that I see between those two events. So, Don, we know now that, there's, um, that this actually did happen. We know that there was a release into the environment. We know that there are a number of options, one having to do with the site itself, the other having to do with uh, perhaps the canister the canisters, uh, we also know that there's, that nobody knows anything about it still. And I'm curious as to why they didn't send robots down there or, or, or have done some kind of surveillance. But I guess more than that, I really would like you to sort of explain what the possible options are as to how this happened. So it's important to emphasize that we don't know, I don't know, nobody knows yet what happened. When robots or people, robots and people, if their robots ever go down, and there aren't any robots at WIP under normal circumstances, really? so there's no way to do that. Now, do folks like Sandia Labs, which is involved, have robots? The answer is yes. So, so far they haven't publicly talked about the option of sending robots down. They've talked about sending probes and making sure they think that the air is okay and then sending a few people down to kind of look at things. Um, but we we don't know what what um, what happened, and they are, and and I'm okay with the idea of they're taking their time to try to figure out 
what they need to do to train the people who are ultimately going to go underground so that, you know, they're hopefully prepared for any one of a wide variety of options of what they might see and what they might find or not find. And I also want to say it's likely that they'll be able to pretty well figure out what happened, but it's also possible that they may not, just to set a little context for that. WIP has been operating for almost 15 years. There are about 170,000 containers of waste in the underground, more than 90,000 cubic meters. They, the alarm that went off was outside of panel 7, which is a brand new panel that they've just started putting waste in in the end of January. So it had been open for less than two weeks when the fire happened, which stopped putting anything more in. And, of course, they haven't put any more in uh, since, since February 5th. So there are 258 containers of contact-handled waste. So if the release was all caused by that room 7, panel 7, one or more of the 258 containers, that's, you know, a small enough contained enough area that presumably one can look at it and take some radiation readings and take some pictures and kind of figure out what happened. But if it wasn't there, or especially if it wasn't there and it was someplace else in the mine with some number of these other 170,000 containers, I mean, just think about how are you, I mean, you know, it won't be right out in front probably, so how are you going to figure out where, you know, where it's coming from? I mean, they'll be able to take some additional radiation readings and figure something out. But it, the point is it may not be visible when you go down what's happened, or it may well be very visible what happened. But in general, there are kind of two basic options. Um, but again, neither of neither or both, whatever combination of the options was ever supposed to happen. One is there was some kind of problem with the geology. A roof fell, a wall collapsed, the floor suddenly heaved up, and something like that. That's not supposed to happen because one of the attributes of this is there's been potash mining in similar formations for decades, They've been underground at WIP for more than 30 years, and so they've always said they fully understand what's going on down there. And so they're able to do things to make sure ceilings don't collapse and walls don't collapse and all those kinds of things. So if on a brand new panel that was just starting to be used, something like that happened, that would fundamentally say... They don't really understand what's going on in the geology down there. So that, that, that would not be okay. If it's in the containers, if, so for example, um, some site shipped some materials, flammable, explosive kinds of materials that are prohibited from WIP, that wouldn't be okay either because that, that says the system at, that creates the 170,000 and supposedly more to come because remember we're only, that 90,000 cubic meters of waste is only a little more than half of what the legal limit of WIP is supposed to be so so but so if that part of the system is flawed then that creates major concerns about do they know what's going on and is the system really working or are there fundamental sort of fatal flaws in the system so either of the two basic options the underground failed and they didn't understand that that was going to happen or that the canister handling, characterizing, packaging failed. Um, that's not, neither of those things, again, this is not supposed to happen, either of those things or some combination of the two happening, you know, is, is, is not a good thing. So, so somewhere in some range of those things would appear to be what was the case Again, to remind people, you know, can workers run into things or forklifts or things get dropped or whatever with mechanical failure or whatever? Yes, that can happen, but we've been told over and over and over there were no workers in the underground at 11.30 at night. And in fact, the last worker left the underground at 5 o'clock 
on that day. So you had six and a half hours. So it's hard to imagine that there was something that somebody or some piece of runaway equipment did or something like that. So again, those are in theory other kinds of things that could cause something like this to happen. But those kind of human caused mechanical error kinds of things don't really seem to be things that should be at work here. But again, we don't know. Uh, that's why eventually, after time and training and trying to figure out what the safest way to go underground is and to see what you find out and then what you find out to come out and talk about, okay, now what do we do next, given what we know then at that point. So this has to be a clo uh, slow, careful process. I guess another major point to just remind people of in this, this is a salt mine, and there are lots of salt mines. But there are no salt mines, no other salt mines in this country that are geologic repositories for nuclear waste. So there's no history in this country of if you contaminate or have contamination of, in this case, potentially 3,000 feet of floor ceiling walls in the underground salt mine, there's no experience in, okay, what do you do in that kind of situation. So we are talking about an unknown process that wasn't expected to happen. There aren't plans for what to do with it. There's no experience, analog experience, as how you would clean it up. Um, the, the two places that could be somewhat analogous are there two other salt mines in Germany that have a significant amount of nuclear waste in them. One of them, an, the, called the Assa salt mine in Germany, actually failed so miserably with a lot of water coming into the facility that the German government made the decision they were going to try to pull out, retrieve more than 35,000 cubic meters of intermediate level waste from that mine because they think long term it's such a failure that you know they have to try to get it out. So that could be analogous to the whip situation, except they've made a decision to pull it out. They're in the planning process to try to figure out what it would take to pull it out, mm -hmm. but they haven't actually done any, they don't even have a plan for how it's gonna do, let alone having actually done it. So again, we don't really have any experience in the United States or even in the world about what to do in this kind of salt mine, contaminated salt mine situation. So in order to get radioactive material up a shaft of half a mile out into the environment six tenths of a mile it doesn't seem like whatever happened down there can sort of hiss out I mean it seems like more seems pro possible anyway that some that some kind of explosion possibly took place if that would be the case how would such a thing happen well again we don't know but Yes, it's the case that if, and remember, we don't really know for sure what the, where the release started from, et cetera. But again, if we go with this scenario of room seven, panel seven, it's about 1,500 feet from room seven, panel seven to that continuous air monitor that went off with radiation. It's more than 1,500 feet from the air monitor to the exhaust shaft through the tunnels to get to the exhaust staff. So you're 3,000 feet or more of the underground that it's moved in the underground. Now, the ventilation system, which was running, obviously can carry, I mean, it's blowing wind through to ventilate the system, so that can carry some uh, materials, but then, and the ventilation system can do, can carry wind up the 2,150 feet of the exhaust shaft, but then, it gets to the top of the exhaust shaft and it goes at least six tenths of a mile more to get to the air monitoring station that detected it. But again, as we've said, there are apparently um, testing that hasn't been released yet, but it looks like the contamination has gone farther than that. So in any case, yes, it appears that you know, a lot of times the Department of Energy talks about the waste coming to WIP is contaminated gloves and booties. Well, gloves and booties is not what was, you know, flying around. 
Um, so something had to, um, in some way or another, have enough energy and force to cause the radionuclides to move more than a mile and a half from apparently where they started to get to the air monitor or beyond. So again, that raises the question that something happened in the underground more than just, you know, a drum tipping over, falling four feet and, you know, opening up a little bit. I mean, that, 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 that scenario clearly doesn't seem to be credible. But we, as I say, we don't know what happened. There, there are not supposed to explosive are prohibited whip even explosive gases are supposed to be prohibited whip. One of the things that was done because to try to avoid any kind of buildup is you, because of the materials in a lot of the waste coming to whip, you can have hydrogen gas being generated. So each of the containers has a filter in it and a, a vent and a filter so that the radionuclides are supposed to be kept inside the drum, but hydrogen gas, volatile organic compounds can be vented out. So you don't have a situation where there could be a, a buildup to cause any kind of an explosion. So again, if the system, if something happened like that, that you have exploding drums or some kind of explosion, um, that is something that in theory could not happen at WIP. So again, we're in these situations where what happened could not happen, was not supposed to happen. We were supposed to start clean and stay clean. The facility was supposed to not leak, according to the Department of Energy and Nuclear Waste Partners, was not supposed to leak at all for 10,000 years. But less than 15 years after it opened, it had this release, which we don't know how much was released. Um, we don't know why it was released, but we do know that it happened. I mean, there's no controversy at this point that there was a release, but we don't know the, those whys, those hows, those how much, those where is all the contamination, how much is the contamination going to continue to move around. We do know from the data that there continue to be levels of radioactivity in the underground and being detected in the coming up the exhaust shaft through the filters, et cetera. They're, so they're, the data are very low numbers, but again, higher numbers than what historically had ever been before February 14th. Mm -hmm. So at some level, that doesn't, that the numbers are a lot lower than they were, you know, when up around when apparently the, the big leak happened, but there is still radiation in the underground. There's still, the filter, the ventilation system is still working, um, so there still is some uh, amounts of contamination that presumably are still coming out. So the idea that it was a one-time leak that stopped uh, isn't really true based on the data. That doesn't mean we're having a series of continuing explosions or something like that, but there's still the, the radiation hasn't gone away, which again is one of the reasons that they are appropriately being careful about sending anything into the underground because they are definitely going to encounter some amount of radiation when they get underground, and which gets us to one of the big future questions, how do you clean up 3,000 feet or more of contaminated salt? And if you don't do that, doesn't that mean that any worker in the underground from now till as long as WIP is open is going to be exposed? And what do you do about that? So this becomes a very difficult situation. So it's not only an unplanned, unexpected, not supposed to happen release, but now what do we do about it? How do we, you know, decontaminate? How do we fix the problem? Um, there's really no plan to do that. It's going to take a while to figure that out and to hopefully through some kind of public process in addition to just DOE and its contractors deciding for themselves what they think should be done. But hopefully we'll have a public process, an independent technical process to try to figure out, okay, once we know more about what happened and how bad the contamination is in the underground and on the surface, what is it that we have to do going forward? Having been reading in this area for a long time, I I keep on seeing a pattern where something, where some little 
tidbit of information is released that didn't go through uh, the filtration system of the PR process. Uh, and then the DOE usually uh, uh, rescinds uh, or, or denies that that data was even released sometimes or that it was false. And you see this over and over and over and over again. Oh, my heavens, there's, there's, there's a release of X and Y, but don't worry, it's not, uh, it, not going to harm anybody. It's, uh, so I'm, I'm really now, of course, wondering if, if we're going to see this kind of thing happen down there. Are we going to get a, a big cover-up? If we're going to get uh, uh, time frames that are so lengthy that it, uh, that it completely waters down the public interest? That uh, I mean, I really don't know how that's going to operate. But this is a serious, a very serious thing, and an unprecedented thing. And it's, as you've been saying all along, something that is not supposed to have happened, it has happened. Um, so I'd like you to sort of reflect on that a little bit, and then maybe talk a little bit about what this, what this might do in your mind for the idea of using WHIP or even using WHIP as a model for other salt storage for higher waste. So my organization, Southwest Research and Information Center, has always believed that citizen information and citizen involvement is essential. Um, that's the reason we've had, as an organization, such a long-term interest in this facility. You know, uh, the organization has been interested in it since 1972, which, when it was first announced, I've been involved in it since 1975. So we've always been very concerned about trying to make the facility as safe as possible and having as much individual citizen community involvement as possible. That's especially important now when we have this situation where something bad has happened and yes, there will, there's always this tendency to say, well, yeah, something bad happened. Both the project, the site manager for the Department of Energy and the uh, president of the uh, contractor, Nuclear Waste Partnerships, have said more than once this is a very serious thing. So they're not denying that something very serious happened. But they also want to downplay the health effects. Um, they want to give medical advice even though they're not doctors. They want to not alarm people. They don't want to have panic. I don't want to have panic either. But that's why we need information. And so it's not helpful to make conclusory statements but not put out your data that you have, whether you like what the data is or not. And if you think there's some uncertainty in the data, that's fine. That's normal science to have some error bars and, you know, those kinds of things. So just say, you know, here are the uncertainties that we have in, in terms of what we're doing. But it's going to be important. As I say, there are lots of unprecedented things here about, you know, trying to figure out what happened and figuring out what to do about it to keep it from happening again, to how do you decontaminate both the surface and the underground and decide then can you do all of those things in a way that it makes any sense to keep the facility opening uh, open to to bring more waste in etc and if you don't keep the facility open to bring more waste what happens to the waste that's still around the country at various places including los alamos in new mexico so these are very serious issues and yes people need to be involved and um on the one hand, it's hard for people to have a, a lot of attention because there are other things in the world going on yeah. on something that's going to be very slowly evolving. It's not like, you know, from one day to the next, somebody's going to figure right. out, oh, we know everything now, we know what to do, we can get it all done in two days and everything is back to normal. I mean, nothing like that can happen. So, so it's going to be difficult in that regard. In terms of the broader issue of what this means, um, this is, as I mentioned, there. Are, this is the third time that a significant amount of nuclear waste has been put in a deep geologic repository in salt. One in Germany has failed massively and the government's decided they need to try to pull everything out. The second one failed less badly, so it was stopped before it fulfilled its whole mission in terms of all the waste getting into it that was supposed to. And so they're now trying to figure out 
rather than trying to take all that waste out, they're trying to figure out how to kind of close it up in such a way that, you know, it's not a great situation, but, you know, it can be good enough. And then you have WIP, which up until this month, or last month, February, seemed to be the one that's, you know, working better. It had operated longer than the other, or well, it hadn't operated quite as long as, as one, but it had, more waste was in it than, than, than the others. But if these three operating geologic repositories that we've had in the world, each of them have failed for different reasons, then the, that long-term scientific consensus about geologic disposal being okay, again, you're putting these wastes deep underground because they are dangerous for a long time and the safest way to handle them is deep underground. You know, you have to you know, look at that or at least in my view, come, which is a view I've had for a while, to at least come to the conclusion that while geologic repositories may be the right, right way long term, we don't know enough and we should learn enough from what's happened so far to say we're not ready to have geologic repositories and more geologic repositories in salt and in terms of hotter waste that there's generally been a consensus not to put it in salt anyway but, you know, okay, so where are these other places? So, again, that's going to be a long, difficult process. People are going to need to be involved. One of the things that's so difficult about us, it's hard for people to imagine plutonium-239 is has a 24,000-year half-life. So 24,000 years from now, it will still be half as radioactive as it is now. So that means it's a threat for thousands of generations. Well... It's very hard for us to kind of even think, yeah. comprehend, you know, thousands of generations. What's that? We don't have thousands of generations of human history going backwards. Yeah. So how do we even think about that? And so that, you know, again, people can sort of say, oh, well, that's too complicated. Let's not worry about it. But people are going to have to worry about it because what that means is the waste that we have now waste from nuclear bombs, like WIP is supposed to deal with, waste from commercial nuclear power plants, which we have no ge geologic repository since Yucca Mountain, Nevada has gone away. We have none, none even proposed, let alone, you know, figuring out where it's going to be and how it's going to work, etc. So what that means is most waste is going to stay on the surface at nuclear power plants, at nuclear weapons sites for at least decades to come. And so a lot of the citizen focus is going to need to be, what do we need to do to try to ensure the safety of that multi-decade storage at these facilities where it is? At least, so that's a difficult process, but hopefully that can be done. At least one of the threats is alleviated from that for the short run, which is moving it around and transporting it someplace else. Um, and in a lot of cases, well, in essentially every case, the people who are most experienced handling the waste are the people at where it is, right. where it was generated, and they also have a lot of incentive to handle it as safely as possible. So something not related to WIP, but related to nuclear waste, a lot of our waste is at commercial nuclear power plants. The power plants are in the business of generating electricity and profits. But a problem with their waste shuts down their plant, right. which is their electricity, right. and shuts down their money, right. which is their profit. So they have a lot of incentives to make sure that nothing bad happens to the waste. That doesn't mean they don't need citizen input and regulation to try to encourage them to do better, to maybe spend a little more than what they may think is necessary to have more stringent standards. But it makes, to me, it makes a lot of sense to say, okay, <laughs> that's what we need to be focusing on rather than trying to see what place we can have that'll, you know, what what place we can decide is good enough to put it in the ground because it's going to be safe there for thousands of generations, because so far we've had three attempts and none of them, two of them in Germany and one of them in the United States, and none of them has worked. So if there's no way, uh, at least ready way, that we can find a politically 
acceptable, geologically stable place to put all this waste. Um, uh, we're going to have to store it on site in hardened containers in some way or another. Uh, one, I'm, I'm interested to get some clue as to how much we're talking about and how many sites there are. And uh, and what kind of uh, and actually what kind of architecture is involved in in the on-site uh, safe storage? We need to think about things kind of in two buckets. One is the nuclear weapons waste from making uh, historically seven seventy thousand nuclear bombs that we've made in the United States, and the waste the various kinds of waste from that one hand. And then secondly, on the other hand, the much larger amounts of radioactivity that come from the 104 nuclear power plants that have operated in this country. Um, well, it's more than 104 that have operated, but it's about 100 that are operating now, but waste from about 115, 120 nuclear power plants. <clears throat> So going, <clears throat> excuse me, going first to the weapons side, we're continuing, crazy as it might seem, and people don't necessarily think about this, we're continuing to make new bombs in this country. So we're continuing to generate much smaller volumes than we did historically, but we're still generating at Los Alamos, most especially, we're generating more waste every month, you know, every year. So that problem is getting a little bit bigger over time. And so again, yes, but, but the biggest, the biggest um, radioactivity on the weapons side is high level waste that is stored primarily in tanks. This is basically liquid waste and that's a problem with the high level waste. It's liquid waste, mostly in tanks at Hanford, Washington and Savannah River site in South Carolina and lesser amounts, but some amounts at the third site, which is the Idaho National Laboratory. So, so those places are all large facilities. We clearly have to get the liquids into a solid form so they are not leaking into the ground as they are, especially at Hanford. Um, and so they get into more stable form so they can stay more safely at those sites for long term. In terms of the nuclear power plants, as I said, that's a lot more radioactivity and it's growing a lot faster. There are about 2,000 tons more spent fuel created every year by those approximately 100 operating nuclear power plants. So we have a serious problem. We have about 70,000 metric tons of spent fuel, virtually all of which is at the power plants. And they're making about 2,000 metric tons more every year. So that problem is very difficult already and continues on a annual basis to get worse because as long as we're generating electricity from nuclear power, we're creating more spent fuel, and so there's more at the sites. There's more need for these kind of hardened on-site facilities um, because, again, liquids, whether they're high-level waste in tanks from military waste or spent fuel in pools at power plants, that's not a long-term stable situation. Um, so we have to get it into a more dry, monitored form um, so that that kind of thing can happen. So again, my, uh, the point of that is that's kind of where we need to have our focus on how to have, make that as safe as possible as opposed to, say, WIP or Yucca Mountain or some other crazy places where you can take it to dispose of it and not worry about it anymore. I guess the other thing I would say, there are some people who say there's an alternative to what I just laid out. And the alternative is what's called consolidated storage. Take the fuel from 115 or so power plant sites and put it into a few sites. Well, my view is that makes no sense from several angles. One is then you're transporting it. So you're creating a new hazard by transporting a lot of spent fuel, which we historically have not transported in this country. So that's not 
something that we're designed to do, and in most cases because they're so heavy, physically heavy, much heavier than the, than the shipments coming to WIP, for example. So most of those shipments would probably have to move by trains. If you've been on the train tracks in this country and you talk to the railroads even, they would say, we are not ready, capable, we don't have, I mean, talk about accidents waiting to happen, mm -hmm. put spent fuel on the railroads and have accidents. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's, so that's one reason not to do consolidated storage, but the other reason is that it doesn't buy you anything. As long as the plants are operating, they're creating more waste. They need to, as we talked about before, they have a lot of incentive to make sure that there isn't any bad thing happen. So they, we can harden it and have as safe a storage in one, in, at each site as we could if we had multiple sites. And the other crazy thing that some people say is the other reason to do consolidated storage is so that you could reprocess the spent fuel to make more radioactive materials, which in theory you would put back into power plants, etc. Well, the reason we have the liquid waste in the tanks at Hanford and Savannah River is because that came from reprocessing. That's the biggest part of our problem. The one commercial site in the United States that tried to do re reprocessing is West Valley, New York, which again totally failed on both environmental and cost standpoints. Reprocessing the French do a lot of reprocessing. Other, a few other countries have tried to do it. Nobody's ever successfully done it from either a financial or a, um, a environmental standpoint. So, so that makes no sense either. So the consolidated storage idea should go away as well. Don, I know this is an ongoing issue, and I sure hope you can come back and talk to us some more about this. And, and, and really, thank you very, very much for being here today. I think you've given our our audience uh, a whole a whole different way of looking at this and uh, with a lot of clarity even in a very murky situation so thanks an awful lot thank you i appreciate your interest and it is an ongoing issue it is going to be important for people to stay informed and involved and so I'll, yeah i'll be glad to continue to the discussion even though i wished we were didn't have this kind of situation that required this kind of uh, very difficult conversation and um, very difficult situation, particularly for people who are directly affected by contamination. Oh yeah, go on, click the subscribe button. Uh, we need to get subscribe and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the Remix button, hit the Remix button, that way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad.